Stanford University. Welcome back. And now for something completely different, um, the Frankie science of the mind. Um, Baba Shiv and his son conjured up this word, Frinky, which he describes as an amalgam of funky and freaky. Um, I realize it sounds a little like a joke, but his research is no joke and neither is he. Uh, he researches the science of decision making, especially consumer decisions and the role of emotion in decision making. You want to know how the price you paid for a bottle of wine affects how good it tastes to you? He's your man. But his principles apply to larger decisions as well. He's been at Stanford since 2005, came here from the University of Iowa, and before that, um, had a career in industry in India. Baba Shiv. Thank you. So just to add a little bit more about how this title came up, I had to put together this course uh, uh, for the MBA students at the Graduate School of Business. Uh, it was a week-long seminar. And I was toying with different titles. You know, it cannot be funky. That's not good enough. Freaky, Freakonomics has been taken up. So I had to come up with something. And like uh, uh, Jim said, this is my son. He's playing on his video console, barely listening to me. And then he says, Dad, go with Frinky. And I say, what is Frinky? Well, funky and freaky is Frinky. <laughs> and that's how this title came about. OK, um, very good morning to all of you. Um, it's going to be quite different, as Jim said, than the previous uh, talk that you heard. Broadly speaking, the way I'm going to structure this particular lecture, if you might call it that, uh, is I'll first get into the emotional brain and talk about you know, what role does emotion play in human decision making. I'll then open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, we will go on with the questioning for about, the first module should last about half an hour, I guess, depending upon clarificatory questions. If you have any clarificatory questions, you can raise your hand and I'll clarify. So half an hour to 40 minutes, I would guess. Then we'll get into the question and answer session. And then 12 o'clock, I'll get into the second module, which is where you'll get a taste of you really get what you pay for. OK, this, this famous <laughs> adage. Okay. To kind of frame the whole thing about the emotional brain and decision making, let's go back to a question that has been debated for centuries, if you think about it. Go back to the time of Plato, uh, Aristotle, Descartes, and so on. And that is, by and large, is emotion beneficial for human decision making or detrimental to human decision making? And if you think about it, the view that pervaded the centuries was that emotion, by and large, is detrimental. Right? If you think about it, it is like the wild horse that needs to be reined in. And therefore, a good decision is one that is made in an analytical fashion. So think about Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of this country. When if, if you had asked him, so let's say you're struggling with a decision, and this may be going on in many of your minds, at least it's going on in many of my journalist friends' minds, and that is, should I be doing what I'm doing right now, or should I quit and do something else? Right? I mean, this is playing in, in many of your minds. So you're faced with a decision dilemma. And um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm only if half facetious out here. It's true. I mean, this, it's, it's, a, it's so different right now, the industry itself, compared to how it was a few years ago. But you're faced with a decision dilemma. And if you had asked Benjamin Franklin, how, how should I go about making up my mind, what he would have advised you to do is list down all the positives and all the negatives of your present option. List down all the positives and negatives of the alternatives that you have. You know, and then choose that option that has got the greatest number of positive and the least number of negatives. Again, suggesting that a good decision is one that is made in an analytical fashion. You're breaking this down and so on. This viewpoint continued until about the late 1960s, uh, early 70s, when first it, it was the evolutionary psychologists who came in. Now, keep in mind, they don't have any data. <laughs> but they were making very compelling arguments. And the argument was that. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, the argument they were making was that, you know what, if emotion were detrimental to humans and human decision making, we would have evolved quite differently. For example, think about the mother-baby bond, emotional bond. It is so crucial for the development of the baby, physically, mentally, and so on. And if emotion had not been important, we would have evolved quite differently. Of course, they don't have any data, and that's where the neuroscientists came in. And this all happened before the advent of what is now referred to as the decade of the brain, right? The 1990s is referred to as the decade of the brain, where there was this exponential growth in our knowledge of the neural structures, the neural functioning, and so on. So this happened probably in the late 1980s and, continued, and continues to this day. 
it was a neuroscientist who started providing evidence now in support of this diametrically opposite viewpoint, that emotion is essential for and fundamental to making good decisions. The first recorded evidence, and some of you probably know of this story, is the unfortunate story of Phineas Gage. So for those of you who are not aware of this gentleman, he was, uh, this whole thing is set in the mid-1800s, 1847 to be precise. He is in Vermont, in the United States, Northeast. He is a railroad worker, so he's laying down all the tracks. Uh, he's actually a foreman, so he's a manager of people, very polite, very respectful, uh, reasonably well financially, extremely well socially, has friends and uh, in a relationship and so on. Unfortunately, one day meets with an accident. There's an explosion that drives a tamping iron. So tamping iron is a big rod out there, about an inch in diameter. The explosion drives the tamping iron through his left cheekbone, and it emerges out of his skull. To everyone's amazement, he survives the accident. Now, he is dizzy, dazed, and so on, but he's able to walk, he's able to talk, and I'll come to that in a second. His brain is still preserved in one of the museums at Harvard, the Harvard Medical Museum, and was subject to a forensic neuroscience examination. So what you do here is that you're left with the remains, in this case, Phineas Gage's skull, and you're trying to make some assessments about which soft tissues got damaged because of this explosion, this accident. And what these team of researchers concluded was that what this accident had done was damage a very critical area of our emotional circuitry, what is referred to as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So I have my spare brain here. <laughs> uh, and by the way, I mean, I, you know, in school we are told that the way you think about the size of the brain is to keep your fists together like that. No, our brain is much bigger than that. That'll be a monkey's brain. This is a human brain. So, the terminology is very simple. This is the dorsal side, which is the dorsal fin in a shark, the ventral below. This is the lateral. This is the medial. So what got damaged was the prefrontal cortex, this is the prefrontal cortex, most developed for human beings. And it was the ventral and medial part of it. Very, very critical area of our emotional circuitry. And that's what these team of researchers concluded, what this accident had done for Phineas Gage. Now, remember I said that he survives the accident, everyone's amazement, but Gage was no longer Gage. There was a marked change in his personality, as you can see from his doctor's report. Here's a gentleman, think about it, was a manager of people, polite, respectful, reverent, and so on, now becomes irreverent becomes grossly profane, profanity, bad language, unrestrained behavior. So he would kind of, this, this kind of bursts of anger, right? I mean, you and I have been in meetings, I mean, especially you with your bosses and so on, and you want to really strangle your boss. <laughs> but you don't do that, because we can restrain ourselves. He wouldn't be able to do that. He would get into this burst of anger. And the other thing that you notice is that he became indecisive, this constant state of indecision. He would adopt one course of action, abandon that, take another course of action, abandon that, and so on. He goes on to live for another 12 years, which is surprising. Here's a guy with a hole in his head walking around. But you begin to see now a pattern that emerges. One is, he doesn't seem to be learning from mistakes. He would lend money to someone. Now, if you and I do it, and the person now doesn't return the money, the next time the person comes to you, you're not going to lend the money to that individual, right? He wouldn't do that. He'll give the money again. He doesn't learn from mistakes, doesn't learn from successes. This impulsive behavior. And the other thing is that this lack of ability to make a decision. So he moves from town to town. He cannot hold on to a job. He finally dies in San Francisco 12 years later. First recorded evidence, if you think about it, where emotion might actually be central to decision making. Because look at this gentleman. He lost a critical area of his emotional circuitry and ends up repeating mistakes, ends up being very impulsive, and just not able to make a decision. Now, of course, you're going to argue, hey, you know what? This is a sample size of one. And here is a weird guy walking around with a hole in the head. And there are going to be these social issues out there. <laughs> and that might have caused this whole thing. Turns out that the same thing before after pattern is also observed with patients who predominantly who suffered a stroke. People like you and me will have suffered a stroke, which takes away areas of the emotional circuitry. It doesn't happen if the stroke takes away neighboring areas. It happens only if it hits the emotional circuitry. And the critical areas of the emotional circuitry will one be the amygdala. These are two almond-shaped structures in the limbic structure of the brain. Often does, doesn't get damaged due to a stroke. 
it has to be mostly disease like syphilis or has to be something congenital to destroy the amygdala. So keep in mind, these patients who had a stroke will have an intact amygdala, most of them. But the other critical areas are in the cortical structures of the brain. One is the insular cortex, the very large neural structure. One is the somatosensory cortex. And what I mentioned, which is what Phoenix case lost, was the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. It's the same before after patterns with them. Remember, it only happens if the neural structures associated with emotion are knocked off, not any other area. The same patterns will be, you'll see that they'll keep repeating mistakes. Typically, they'll end up with a lot of traffic tickets. Right? I mean, if you and I, if you and I, you know, you have this traffic ticket, you have this blazing thing that is going on out there, red lights, the cop is coming, your heart is racing out there. That is an emotion, and that is centered in the amygdala. Now, the next time, maybe even a week later, a month later, you're driving down something quite similar to that, even if you're preoccupied, you're thinking about other things that is going on, you know, what is the story, I have a deadline to meet, and so on, you walk, go there, your body will suddenly freeze. You will start focusing and you literally will take the foot off the pedal before you even realize you've done it consciously. That is all the emotional brain. That is the, that is the uh, cortical structures of the brain. So they will keep repeating these mistakes. You'll see that they'll have a lot of this impulsivity that is displayed. And the other one is that they simply cannot make up their mind. So let me share this um, with you. So when I was at the University of Iowa, and one of the reasons I went there was that it has got probably the largest registry of patients with brain injuries. So what happens is that if someone suffers a stroke, he or she is brought to the University of Iowa hospital, stabilized, we take a full MRI scan and find out which areas have been knocked off. And then what we do is we ask the patient, ask the family and other thing members out there, would you like to be part of a registry? So what do you get in return? Well, we bring you at our cost to the University of Iowa hospitals every year. You're put up for two to three days at our expense and you'll go through free diagnostic tests, but you also take part in some fun studies. Okay? And, and these are truly fun studies. You'll see this, I'll present this later on. Um, these are fun studies, and they love doing it. They just love doing it. Um, you'll see the same thing happening there. So here's an example. We knew when the patients were scheduled. Typically, they come in summers because winter you know, has hazards to drive in those areas, so it's going to be over the summer. We know the schedules, so we go to these patients and ask them, okay, and ask them, we're going to give you some goodies when you're here. Let us know how much you prefer these items. And what we did was identify two items that they would equally prefer. So for one gentleman who had this, uh, an area of the emotional brain knocked off, his preference was for a pen and a wallet. We knew that this was equally preferred by this gentleman. So he has done his first day of diagnostic tests and studies and so on, time for him to go, to the, uh, go back to the hotel, and we offer him this pen and a wallet. Now, for most of you, I would guess all of you, if you're faced with such a trivial decision, you're going to examine the pen, examine the wallet, think a little bit, grab one, and go. That's all. It's non-consequential. It's just a pen and a wallet. This patient didn't do that. What this patient did was, he does the same thing that we would do, examine them, think a little bit. He grabs the pen, starts walking, hesitates, grabs the wallet. He goes outside our office, comes back, and picks up the pen. He goes to his hotel room. Believe me, inconsequential decision. He leaves a message in a voicemail, voice mailbox saying that, when I come tomorrow, can I pick up the wallet? This constant state of indecision. Now, one thing you've got to keep in mind, one thing you've got to keep in mind here is that, and this is how they generally cope in the day-to-day -day lives. They will form preferences for one single item so that they're never faced with a decision dilemma. One ketchup, one toothpaste, one bath soap, because they don't want to face the decision dilemma. Now, if you offer them, so for example, if there's, a clear, if there's only one item, no problem. If the person had preferred the pen over the wallet, Clear preference out there, no problem. They'll pick the pen and walk away. If I'd give, them two, give uh, this gentleman two pens, maybe of different colors, but color doesn't matter for this gentleman, no problem. A equal A, he'll pick one and go. No problem. Where the problem happens is where there is a decision dilemma, which is what was happening for this gentleman because he didn't know which he preferred more. 
This, by the way, also happens in normal individuals. So in our studies, what we have done is we can identify individuals by presenting a scale item. Uh, are they on the higher side of the emotional sensitivity or on the lower side? And just for the sake of convenience, these are not, doesn't have any meaning associated with them. We call them emotionals and Vulcans. <laughs> OK, just for the sake of convenience. OK. So obviously, emotionals are one that are more sensitive. And, and it's also kind of not surprising, if you should ask me, are there any gender differences? It's very clear that women generally tend to fall in the emotional side of the spectrum. And that's not surprising. It must have happened for evolutionary reasons. And therefore, one thing I'll be pointing out is that, in, at least based on this talk, that in general, women make better decisions. But <laughs> there has to be a but. You will see when you get into relationships, women, the same people who are highly emotional, I mean, they have a more sensitive emotional circuitry, generally start faltering. They're not very good at relationships, or at least before you're trying to decide on who you want to live with for the rest of your life and so on. They're not good at that. And we'll get into that, this whole notion of arranged marriages and love marriages. OK, all they piqued your interest, right? Yeah, we'll get into that, don't worry. OK, and I'm sure some of you are also wondering here, I mean, am I a Vulcan? I do this all the time. I'm in a constant state of indecision. Boy, for the last two years, I've been thinking about whether I should quit this job and do something else or not. I mean, am I a Vulcan? <laughs> right? That's not the case. That's not the case. Most often, that happens because you become too analytical. And you don't bring emotion into play when making a decision. Now. So what we have from all this evidence that has come up now for the last roughly two decades now is that emotion is crucial for us because it helps us prevent mistakes, learn from successes, it avoids impulsive behaviors, and most important, it allows us to make a decision. Let's focus on the third point, and that is it allows people to decide, to commit, to feel convinced that what they have chosen is the right one, not just keep vacillating. And let's look at why this happens. So if you think about the way the brain works, when it is faced with a decision dilemma, so here A equals B, it's not A equals A, A greater than B, and so on. If you're faced with the dilemma, decision dilemma, the brain doesn't do what the economists would advise us to do. The economists would say, what you should do when you face the decision dilemma is adopt what is called the completeness principle. So what you do here is acquire more and more and more information about the two options until there's a dominant structure that emerges, okay, where you can pick A or B, as the case might be. Or you might have a deadline, or you might say, I want to grab 10 pieces of information. And if you're still stuck with A equal B, all you have to do is toss a fair coin. And that'll be fine. That's what the economists would tell us to do. The brain doesn't work that way. It must have happened for evolutionary reasons. I'll get to that in a second. What the brain does is, it might start off in a very unbiased fashion by acquiring information about the options and evaluating the piece of information. But at some point in time, there's an emotional signal that goes in favor of one of the options. It's a very non-conscious process. You don't know about it. In other words, one of these options gets bestowed as the emotional leader. Once that happens, you might think you're engaging in a very rational decision making, acquiring information, evaluating information, and so on. But your brain is not doing that. Your brain is engaging in what we call pre-decisional distortion of information. <laughs> so it biases the information in favor of the emotional leader. If there is positive information, it augments the positive. If there's negative information, unless it is egregious, keep that in mind, the brain is not stupid. If there is some information that is egregiously negative, it will reject and reevaluate the options. But in general, in life, nothing is egregious. There are some negatives, some positives, and so on. You can live with some things, right? Now, so what it does here, it starts biasing this information. And if you think about the following, this is what happens. So let us say that you are deciding between two options. Should I stick with this job right now or go for some other option? And let us say that you are evaluating this on different attributes. For example, how much of freedom will I have in my life? 
And let us say that, you know what, if I do something else rather than sticking to my present job, that's going to be more freedom. Right? So when I'm going to ask you to evaluate that option of quitting and doing something else, you will rate that favorably. So if you're objective on a minus five to plus five scale, you might give that as a plus two. You with me? I'm sticking to the green line now. That is, if you're being objective. Second piece of information might also be favorable for that option. You're going to now cumulatively, it becomes even more positive. The third piece of information is negative. Maybe you have to take a pay cut. Maybe there's risk involved, uncertainty involved, right? This will be negative now, negative, then this may be a positive information, some neutral information, and so on. So if you're objective, you're truly objective, what will happen is this particular line. But what emotionals would do is bias the information. Once an emotional leader has been formed, especially when the first attribute is, how much fun will I have? I mean, compared to this job, this is something else. And let us say it's a lot of fun out there. It'll hit, and the emotional signal hits in right off the bat. You don't know about it. And thereafter, you're biasing this information. If it is negative, it's less negative. If it is positive, it's more positive. As a result of which, at the end of the day, you're left with a clear dominant structure, where A, is much better than B, which means if you pick A now, you're very confident that you made the right decision. You're committed. Now, what happens with Vulcans, what happens with patients, and so on, is for them, they don't have that emotional signal, or the emotional signal, the onset of that comes very late, or if you become too analytical, not bringing the emotions into play, what will happen is that there's no emotional marker out there in favor of one, there's no emotional leader, so you're just acquiring this information. Some of them are gonna be positive, some of them are gonna be negative. At the end of the day, you're left with almost A equals B, which means you're stuck with the decision dilemma. So you pick A, you're not sure. Pick B, you're not sure either. Make sense? Okay. So what this is telling us is that one critical function of the human brain is to resolve trade-off conflicts, decision dilemmas. And it does so by having this emotional signal go in favor of one of the options. And thereafter, what the brain is doing is engaging in this kind of pre-decisional distortion. And if you think about it, this must have happened for evolutionary reasons. If you, th if you think about it, let us say that I'm a caveman. I'm being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. I come to a fork in the road. I cannot be cognitive and rational, think about what are the probabilities and what am I gonna do here and No, you, you gotta just, you just have to go choose the thing and move on. You'll meet the next fork in the road, move on. And if you, it's interesting that if you go back to the Latin root of the word decision, it comes from the word decidier, which comes from the word kaidier, which means to cut. So you're making a decision only if after the decision, you're cutting yourself off from the past. And you can do that only if you're making a committed decision. And therefore, you can do that only if you're bringing emotion into the play. OK. Now, so we're going to get back to the, the philosophical question. And that is, is emotion beneficial, by and large, for human decision making, or is it detrimental? What will be your answer? It's good. If I, were, if I were talking to a team of MBA students, and this is the most agonizing thing that happens in a classroom when you're teaching MBAs, when you ask them a question like this, they'll say, it depends. <laughs> and then you've got to say, it depends on what? I mean, come on, tell me, explain. Right? Okay, of course it depends. I mean, think about it. If I'm, if I'm going for, God forbid, for a surgery, and I want to choose a surgeon, I want to choose a Vulcan. I mean, if there's blood coming out, I don't want someone going, oh, blood, I want to do it. You know, I, I want someone who can be truly a Vulcan. If I'm looking for someone to trade for me in the Wall Street and so on, I want to have a Vulcan, someone who's not driven by emotion, someone who can be very rational. So of course it depends. So think about this following thought experiment. Think of this thought experiment. So let's say you're part of a study. And I'm going to tell you that you're going to engage in several rounds of investment decisions. I'm not going to tell you how many, but it's going to be a large number of rounds. And I'm going to endow you with $20 in $1 bills. This can be in any currency, by the way. But this was done in the United States, the study itself. Now, the way the game is going to be played, and this is the instruction that is going to be given to you, that at any point in time, any round, you can decide not to invest. Hold on to the money. Right? In which case, I'll move on to the next round. 
If you decide to invest, you can only invest a dollar and toss a fair coin. If it is heads, you lose the investment. But if it is tails, I'm going to add a dollar fifty to investment, which means you're going to get two dollars and fifty cents back. Now, given the structure, it almost mirrors, if you think about it, the bond market versus the stock market here in terms of the risk profile. And keep in mind, at the end of the day, we're not dealing with fiduciary risk out here. We're talking about, end of the day, your goal is to leave the table with as much money in your pocket as possible. What will you do? Invest in every single round because if you think about the expected values, the expected value from investing is $1.25, the expected value from not investing is only a dollar. Which means if you don't invest in every single round, you're left with $20. But if you invest, and if you calculate the numbers, we carry this for 20 rounds, by the way. If you do the numbers, you'll see that there's only a 1-3% chance, 13% chance. 87% of the time, you're gonna be better off just investing blindly. But normal individuals behave as follows. We have done this with economic students, finance students. They typically behave in this fashion. If you tell them what they should do, they will take, say exactly what you are. The cognitive brain is telling them keep investing. But when they actually play the game, they will start putting on the brakes so that when they come, they might start off close to what is normative. But when they come, by the time they're in the 20th round, they're only investing in about 50% of the rounds. Suggesting that here, the emotional brain is hijacking the cognitive brain, resulting in suboptimal decisions. So why does this happen? Let's think about it. Let's go back to the neural structures. So one neural structure that I didn't talk about, and I should have, is what is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So if you go back to my spare brain here, this is the dorsal side and the lateral side and the prefrontal cortex. So these are the areas that we often refer to, our psychologists often refer to as the working memory. If I'm going to ask you to memorize a seven-digit number, eight-digit number right now, what is going on in your head is all happening here in the dorsolateral. That's a cognitive brain. So when you start off with this task, think about it. You have a pretty good idea given the structure of the task, and we have done this even with illiterates in India. They have this idea about what is normative. Given this task, they'll say invest. Right? So what you have here is your cognitive brain initially is saying invest. Go ahead, invest, given the structure of the task. Now you invest. Now I will toss a fair coin. If it is heads, you lose the money. And what happens? You go, oh. That is an emotion. If you win, what happens? You go, yeah. That is an emotion too, right? Now those emotions, what we call stimulus-based emotions or outcome-based emotions, I know what is the outcome of a decision right now, are referred to, are centered in the amygdala. Okay, that is the neural structure where this is centered. Now I have to make my decision on the next round. My cognitive brain is saying, invest. But I also know what happened on the previous round are rounds. I've won in some, I've lost in some. They are all tagged with emotion. Those emotions are being read off non-consciously by these neural structures, the insula, the somatosensory, and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And they are telling, keep in mind, that there are going to be some wins, positive, some losses, negative. But over a period of time, as the rounds begin to progress, there are positives and negatives because there's a 50% chance of one happening or the other. When two emotions, positive and negative, impinge on the neural structure, unless you are a functional psychopath, where the wiring is the opposite. For most normal individuals, negatives will win out. The brain inherently is loss averse. So what is happening with all these emotions coming in is that you have the emotional brain telling you not to invest, to become conservative. You have this invest, and you're now faced with a decision dilemma. The brain is faced with a decision dilemma. And in general, when the brain is faced with such a decision dilemma where you have emotion and cognition, the emotional brain will win out. So let us think about a frinky prediction here. Take the same patients who just couldn't make a decision. Pen in a wallet, just couldn't make up his mind. But put him in a task like this, which is almost like trading now. That patient has no, none of these emotions coming into play. Yeah, the amygdala is going to light off. They also go, yeah, and ooh, and so on. But when they have to make a decision on the next round or rounds, there's no emotion from the cortical structures that is telling them, no, 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 put on the brakes. So they don't have a decision dilemma. They don't have this red line coming down. 
They're only left with the green line. So you can make a fringy, fringy prediction that the same brain damaged people will end up making better decisions. <laughs> right? That's a fringy prediction. <laughs> that they will behave more optimally than the normal individuals. And that's essentially what we found. So I remember I talked about this fun experiment that we carried out. We had three groups of people. One is normal individuals, you and me. You know, we control this for age and intelligence and so on with the patients. There are two groups of patients, and we need that. One is patients with damage to the emotional circuitry. Another is patients who have stroke, accidents, et cetera, but that stroke or accident didn't take away areas of the emotional circuitry. I need that control group, lesion control group. Why? Otherwise, you can come back and say, these people have gone through near-death experiences. Come on, what is $20 for them? We'll just keep investing. <laughs> so I want to choose people who have also gone through these near-death experiences but it didn't take away the emotional areas. And what I should predict is that even those lesion patients who didn't have damage to the emotional circuitry will behave like the normals, will start becoming conservative. Whereas it's only people with damage to the emotional circuitry will behave optimally. And that's essentially what we found in that study. So we can think about the implications. We are all this news about doom and gloom and stock market coming down, going up, and all this fear that is pervading out there. There can be one solution to this problem. So, and this will come from the video clip I'm going to show you. My only claim to fame is appearing in a Jay Leno show. Not me, my research. So let me share that with you, and that will give you some ideas about how we can solve this problem, this economic malaise right now, fear, gloom, and so on. Now, according to a bizarre study at the Stanford Business School, now this is real, this is one of these amazing things. They say people suffering from brain damage did better at investing money than normal people. No, 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 this is true, this is a real study. It said hospital patients with, with actual severe brain damage outperformed normal, healthy people in an investing contest. So if you're trying to make money in the stock market and you feel like you're banging your head against the wall, keep banging your head against the wall. Because it will get better. solution, right? Scientists no, no liability issues. Obama just has to hand up, stand up there and say, hey, guys, just keep banging your head against the wall. <laughs> Things will get better. I'm just kidding. OK. Now let's get into the other situation. So clearly, if you think about it, it all depends. Women, in general, what we have found, do make better decisions. They're more committed decisions, they learn from their mistakes, they learn from their successes, and so on. There are certain contexts where they won't perform well. One will be surgery, for example. That's where you'll see a lot more males in that particular profession. Uh, you'll start seeing traders, for example. You can't be emotional out there. Um, and there's one more context where you'll see that um, emotion can actually hijack the cognitive brain. And that is this whole notion of arranged marriages and love marriages. So here is a decision context. If you're making up your mind on something, let us say choosing jobs and so on, one way to do that is to have all the alternatives. You have your present job, you have all the options. One is to lay out all the options. You're getting all the information about the options. And then you say, OK, I'm going to choose the best among these options. That is a simultaneous decision. Right? It's almost like an arranged marriage where you have a fixed set of options and you're choosing the best among the lot. Or you can do the following, which is a sequential choice. You have all the options coming up one at a time. Right? This is what happens in relationships as well. You date a person, and you have to make a decision now. Should I stick to that option, to that person, or reject that person, give up, and move on to the next option? And keep in mind, very often when that happens, the bird in the bush is unknown. You don't know the bird in the bush. You know the bird in hand. <laughs> and very often, what will happen is, if you reject the present option, the present object will go away. So you keep doing this. You go to option B, you go to option C, you go to option D, and so on and so forth, and you make a decision along the way. So you might have picked up the second option, you might have picked up the third option, you might have waited until the fifth option, you might be still indecisive, and so on. So one of the research questions that we're asking here 
is which one of these decision makers, simultaneous or sequential, arranged or love, which of the decision makers at the end of the day are going to be committed to the decision, are going to be convinced that they made the right choice? Turns out that it is the simultaneous choosers who are going to be happier. Because if you think about it, for the simultaneous choosers, the task is one about, I have these five options, or four options, or three options, and I have to choose the best among them. The brain is not thinking about, are there other options out there? Whereas, if you think about sequential choices, you're talking about, I have the present option. Man, should I stick with it or not? And very often, I don't know what the next one is going to be. And we find that sequential choosers are less committed because two emotions come into play. And this is where women have this problem with sequential choices compared to simultaneous. And the two emotions are, one is the emotion of hope. You're optimists. We are all eternal optimists. We think that the next option is going to be better than the present option. right? It's almost like this crazy thing. I call this as the uh, in constant search for the right, which means the right person, the right option, or the right side end of the bell curve. And in real life, if you think about it, the options you're going to face are going to fall somewhere, right? I mean, some of, most of them are going to fall here, where you have the peak. They're going to be some of the extreme, which means that if you have an option right now which falls in the 85th percentile, you're much better off just sticking to that option and moving on, right? But the brain doesn't do that. What the brain says is that, well, the next option is probably going to be better than the present option. <laughs> so that is hope. And this fear of being stuck with an inferior option as a result of which women in these contexts will start making less committed decisions. Even if they make a choice, they're not too sure if they made the right choice or not. So advice to women is to adopt a simultaneous mode of decision making rather than the sequential mode of decision making. Okay? So let me pause here now. Uh, appropriate time for me to take questions from the audience. We'll go on till about 12 o'clock. And then I'll kind of switch gears and move on to my other research, Frinky research on the price placebo effect, where we'll get into this whole notion that you really get what you pay for. So I'll be open to any questions that you might have. Go ahead, Jen. So I was curious, is there, a, is there a genetic basis to Vulcan versus emotion, or is, is it uh, all just mm. circumstantial and environmental? We really don't know. Um, there are arguments being made that uh, there is a self-selection that goes on in people who become successful in certain professions, for example, surgery and, um, and the army and so on, where you need to have Vulcans, fighter pilots, for example, how to be more Vulcan and so on. And we generally t see that they tend to be more Vulcanish in their behavior. So they'll be doing extremely well in, as a fighter pilot. Now keep in mind, as a fighter pilot, you're trained not to have decision dilemmas. You have a problem, do X, Y, Z, boom, that's it. As a surgeon, you don't face a decision dilemma because you do X, Y, Z, finish it off. There's no kind of, should I do this, should I do that, and so on. But when they get out of their profession and they face these decision dilemmas, they'll often fail. And we don't know at this juncture, is that nature or is it nurture? One theory that is emerging out there that it might be a combination of the two. In the sense, it's an easy answer to give, right? But there is this, the, where the, the science is coming from is that we are likely to be predisposed to be an emotional or a Vulcan. And depending upon the external circumstances out there, and the idea now, so called, this is called gene expression, by the way, and it is interesting that this gene expression can occur in the third trimester of pregnancy. So, which means that if the mother is very stressed, the body thinks that when this child is going to be born, the environment is going to be stressful. So I would rather have the system geared in such a way that this person becomes emotional, and not only emotional, but emotional more like a neurotic. Like a neuroticism is, is kind of a, a personality variable where people are constantly neurotic, stressed, look at the negatives, and so on. Because that's how is you going to be safe. On the other hand, if the mother is calm or excited and so on, then what happens, the gene expression says everything is safe out there, which means that I can be in a more exploratory mode. I can be someone who can try new things out. I can be novelty-seeking out there. 
and it starts getting expressed. And the area of the brain that we believe, it's, it's basically three, three uh, neural chemical structures. One is the dopamine structure, which I'll get to uh, when I talk about the price placebo effect, which is very rich in dopamine. It's a striatum, the part of the brain. And then you have the cortisol, uh, cortisol and serotonin complex, as it is referred to. It's one kind of the area there. So the greater the level of serotonin, more calm you are, right? Serotonin, that's why you have Prozac and so on. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It kind of calms you down. Um, cortisol, on the other hand, is stress. And depending upon the ratio of this cortisol to thing, and that can be predisposed. Genetically, you can have both of these. You're going to end up being much more of emotional, if it's in the extreme, or not. So I think, so, and, and this can also evolve. And the other belief that is coming right now is that it is all this personality trait is being formed in the third trimester and probably in the first four years when the thing is being developed. Now, the other thing that can happen, and this is where the, 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 uh, nu the nurture part of it can, and it, I, won't, I don't like to call it nurture now because I'm going to talk about alcohol and drugs, but this is where the environment can shape the development. Keep in mind, and those of you who have kids, you've got to be very careful about this, is that if you think about the prefrontal cortex, this I said is the most developed for human beings, this area of the brain is still developing until the age of about 20, 21. And as the, the fastest growth that takes place to this is at the time of puberty. If at that point in time, the person is consuming alcohol or worse, doing drugs like heroin and cocaine and so on, that will just stop the growth of the prefrontal cortex. And you'll start seeing that these people end up behaving more like Vulcans. And therefore, there is a correlation. If you think about it, we have done these studies where you'll see that people who are traders in Wall Street also have problems of addiction. So we don't know whether it is nature or nurture out there. Is it possible that it was the addiction early onset of that that knocked off the prefrontal cortex and that kind of you know, makes them became, become Vulcanish in a trading situation, but when they go elsewhere, they screw up? Long answer to a short question, but I think it's a very, very good question that you asked. All right, so I'll give you a long question yeah. for a short answer. <laughs> so the popular research that gets to us would suggest, and, and yours is in that vein, would suggest that um, Oliver Sacks' research would suggest the co social consequences of impaired brains, um, brain damage, and Eric Kandel would perhaps suggest that we're vulcanized, which brings us to your theory just posited. That's the popular research we get. Is that congruent with the other research that's going on that we don't know about? It's, it's very congruent. So, it, so the, uh, the final answer to all these things and this debate is much more nuanced. So you'll start seeing that in social situations, uh, you got to have, so for example, um, I'm, I'm probably going to take the uh, luxury, because you made the offer, of offering either a short answer or a long answer, which will be a slightly longer answer, but it will be very revealing. So we did a study of salespeople in an organization which I cannot mention for confidentiality reasons, set in the Midwest of the United States, and you have these salespeople selling you know, equipment worth millions of dollars. And you're not talking about consumers here. You're talking about you know, companies that they're selling this to, millions of dollars. Right? And one thing that we wanted to find out, now these are all engineers, it's an engineering firm, so all the people there in sales are males, so we cannot kind of extend this to females. But one thing that we wanted to find out was there are these super successful salesmen. They fall in the 99th percentile every single year, I and mean, our cutoff was five years. We compare them not to people who are in the 50th percentile, but compare them to people who don't fall in the 99th percentile consistently for the last five years, but are about the 95th percentile. So they're good, but they're not super. And we collect a whole host of variables. Two variables stand out. One is height. Don't ask me why, I won't get into that. <laughs> the second one, which goes to your point, and that's why it's so nuanced, these people are masters. So those of you who know about neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, the term that is used there is called mirroring. So if this gentleman is sitting like this and he's my customer, I'm the salesperson, I will sit here and adopt the same posture that he's adopting. Okay, it'll be like this, there'll be a smile, and so on. The voice tone, everything will be similar. So that is called mirroring. That's one thing that they do. They're very successful, and they do it very non-consciously, by the way. Which is the, but the idea here being that he feels more comfortable 
or you will feel very comfortable with someone who's kind of doing this. Now, it is not blatant. It's not like blatant imitation, but it just happens. More important thing and is, number one, they are very high on the emotionality scale. They are the classic super emotions to the extent that they can do one thing that many of us cannot do, and that is mentalize. Mentalizing is a phenomenon where I can sit here looking at you out there, and if you are feeling any emotion, like for example, stress, anxiety, and so on, literally my brain begins to experience the same emotion, literally. The same pain areas will go off, which means that they're very good at not only noticing the emotion, but feeling the emotion and immediately correct for them. So you can see how when you get into that kind of a profession, where you're talking about sales, influencing people, politics, you need to have someone who is very high on the emotionality. I can feel your pain. You are a mentalizer there. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm interested how you might apply this dynamic to group decision making. Uh, for example, in the newspaper industry, uh, we were faced with a threat from the internet and yeah. certain decisions were made in the past that turned out to be wrong. Yeah. Uh, how does this apply there? So let me frame this um, and extend this slightly better. The question is, at the end of the day, are you afraid of making type one errors, and I'll explain what is that in a second, or are afraid of making type two errors? Type one error is that you make a decision and that option goes sour. You don't want to make that mistake, right? That's a type one error. If you come to Silicon Valley and you talk to, and you deal with those individuals, they're constantly dealing not with type one error, they're dealing with type two error. The type two error is losing out on a good opportunity. That's a type two error. Now, the way you will rig the system by which, and this is what Google does, by the way, is that you have, so what Google would do is that they'll have teams of three people. One will propose something, an idea, there'll be two other people involved in that team. One person will serve as the devil's advocate. Two people are gonna be a pro, one could be an arbiter and so on. They sit down and discuss. The reason they have two positive and one negative is because they are scared of making type two errors. If you're scared of making type one errors, you'll have two devil's advocates and one would be the positive person. And the important thing out here in deciding on the devil's advocate is not to have the same individual be the devil's advocate. Why? Because if you're in a group and this gentleman out here is constantly being a devil, now he's only kind of pretending to be a devil but my brain start associating him with negative emotion. Which means that tomorrow, if I have to decide on he and she, in terms of a promotion, I would choose her rather than him, non-consciously. So what they do is rotate the devil. So you'll start off with three. There'll be a decision, there'll be, there'll be this documentation that is put up, it'll go to the next level. Same thing happens there, it goes to the next level. And guess who they, how many they have at the top making decisions? Three, Google has three. They do the same thing at different levels. So the basic answer to the question is group decision making, if you're making a group decision making, gear up the system depending upon whether you're scared of type one errors or type two errors, and then it'll change. And then set it up in such a way that it goes forward, one, two, three, four levels. Um, back to the arranged marriages. Yeah. Um, why wouldn't the sequential decision maker who chose option A yeah. be as committed as somebody, uh, as a uh, sir? Yeah, Whatever the so that's a, that's a good, very good question. So if those of you who have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Blink, would say that, you know, just go ahead, intuitively blink, and you would have made the right decision, right? Decisions, good decisions don't work that way. You have to get more information and so on. We find that sequential chooses, exactly as the intuition would suggest, if they choose option A, they're as good as the simultaneous chooses. Why? Because they have only an option set of one, they pick that option, and that's it, they're happy. Where they screw up is they start moving on to the next option. So once they move away from the first option in terms of making a decision, then it, they get into this constant search for the right. And one more, yeah. uh, and that is you said, so we should become more like simultaneous choosers. How does one do that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
you know the story about me, right? So I've got to be careful here because my, sister, my sister-in-law is in the audience out here, so I've got to be careful. Sharing my own kind of marriage, by the way. So I've been married for 20 years now. Um, I met Reva for, what, 20 minutes? Um, and then decided, that she's going to be my partner for life. Uh, and it was an arranged marriage because, you know, I, love marriage is not working out for me. Uh, I don't know why. Um, maybe I was going for super, super people, and, you know, they said, why the heck should I stick with this Baba Shiva out here? Of course, now they know because I'm at Stanford that they made a mistake, but that's the definition. <laughs> so, okay, anyway. So, um, uh, you know, I, I went to my mom and I said, listen, I want to get married out here. So, you know, she decides on the date of the wedding, May 25th, and then we have different options to look at. I look at the first option. She likes me, I don't like her. So if you think about arranged marriages nowadays in India, it doesn't work like how we think stereotypically, right? It's not like, oh, you kind of are kind of decide, uh, parents decide who you're going to marry from the age of three and so on. It's like, it's now very much like the mom, like my mom gave me the option. Do you want to go for an arranged marriage or a love marriage? That's pretty, perfectly fine. And she was shocked. I was the only sibling, we are four, who said, I want to go for an arranged marriage. She was shocked. She said, no, of all people, I would have thought that you would have gone in for a love marriage. It didn't work out. So, so, it's, it's, so this is what is happening here. It was like, you meet the first person. Second was Reva. We met for 20 minutes. And then, you know, we, I decided to get married. She decided to get married to me. Anyway, so that was, a, that was a, simultaneous. It is, like, it is like speed dating, but more slow dating. It happens over a period of about a month, <laughs> right? That is a simultaneous way to make a decision. Um, so if you have, especially in relationships, and this is beginning to happen now, we think about many of the dating websites and so on, eHarmony is a good example, is stuff where you, what they're providing to you is a set of options in place, and you can decide which option is the best amongst that and move on. So one way you might actually rig the system in such a way, in cultures where arranged marriages are not in vogue, is to have these kind of things, like eHarmony, bringing in and forcing people to think in terms of simultaneous rather than sequential. Now, going back to this whole notion of blink, that you make these snap decisions, that is wrong. You can't, you've got to have information. You can't simply go make a decision without information. So love at first sight never works, right? But the way I keep telling people to make a decision is you gather, go through a phase where you're just gathering information. And you can have, you can say, I'll go through a decision phase where I'll choose one of the options or not choose one of the options. So if you, let us say you're facing this dilemma right now, am I gonna to stick to this job or consider the other options? Go through this information gathering phase where you're not making any commitments. Get as much information as you can and then finally get into the decision phase which is where you're going to get emotions into the picture. And I would also advise to the extent that literally sleep on the problem. Sleep does one thing, apart from you know, reinforcing memories and so on, sleep is the one that attaches the emotion very strongly to those memories and allows the bias to take place. So when you're gonna wake up the next day morning, you will have the answer. Or even if you don't have the answer, toss a fair coin. Uh, just before the coin falls, you will have the answer. If you don't get the answer, it means that you still don't have the emotional signals to cause you to make the decision. Go ahead. Is that how you make decisions? <laughs> yeah, I always get this question. Man, I do all this research, uh, and am I like, I'm the classic irrational guy. The classic irrational guy. Uh, and I like it that way. So think about when Stanford comes to me with an offer. They came to me in 2000, they came to me several times before. Uh, they came to me in 2001, 2003, and every time they came, and I'm at the University of Iowa, think about it, a public school, not paying much, and so on, and this is Stanford, right? And I said, no, I don't want to come. Unless you give me tenure, I will not come. And people said, you're crazy. Why would you do that? It's Stanford, I won't go. Finally, in 04, they said, okay, we're ready to make you tenure. I said, okay. And you would have thought that I would have made a snap decision. I said, no, I'm very happy where I am. I can be at Iowa, where I'm a big fish in a small pond. I like that. Why well, go to Stanford and, and things? So I took, a, I took a, you know, I just said, I'm going to, I'm going to take my, make my decision in a year later, a year out, even though you guys have made me a tenure offer. So that's a classic case of this irrational, and I like that. 
I enjoy. A lot of my ideas, a lot of my research ideas comes from this, my own irrationality. And of course, that of my children as well. My, my son, Rahul, he's like that, very irrational. Go ahead. You. Yeah, I'm confused about one of your points and can't make up my mind. <laughs> oh, my goodness. OK. When, when the stock market peaks and starts to go down, mm -hmm. all the investment community says, don't panic. And yet the people who panic make all the money. So when you say that basically emotion shouldn't enter in, how does that factor? OK. Um, there are a couple of ways of responding to that. If you look at a long-term time horizon, now you're right in terms of the short term, that's where the hedge funds make their money and so on. Hedge funds are beginning to predict that, look here, the market is going to panic and do one thing, and we should do the opposite or something like that. And they, they do end up making money in the short term because you can hedge against that. If you look at the long term, and this is, maybe this particular economic downturn is going to change the way economists think about the whole thing. But if you think about it, over the years, it has been this notion of the equity premium puzzle. The equity premium puzzle being saying that, in general, stocks do better than any other investment. They are going to go up. So we're going to be investing for the long haul. So here's the kind of answer to your question. Are you a short-term investor or a long-term investor? If you're a long-term investor, investing for your retirement and so on, and if you believe in the equity premium puzzle, this, that's a, there's a premium for the equity, then literally what you have to do is don't watch television. I don't know if someone here is here from CNBC. Uh, don't watch that. Because that's what, I mean, especially if you're an emotional, you're getting scared. Oh, what do I do with that? You start pulling money out of the stock market, keeping it in your thing, and so on. And then what happens? Here's the rationality. You don't, you, the market starts peaking, going up, and you say, no, 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 no. Again, it's going to come down. Again, it's going to come down. Again, it's going to come down. It keeps going up. No, fear, fear, fear. And then suddenly you see, wait a second. You know what? These guys are making a lot of money. Greed comes in. And you then start putting money into the stock market when you could have made a killing if you had gone early on. Right? So the basic thing is that if you're investing for the long haul, if that is the goal, forget about it. There is going to be, of course, you have to believe in that equity premium puzzle. Now, things might be different with this economy. We don't know. Yeah, that, the long-term investment philosophy holds if you look at data over like a 60 to 80 year period. If you look at the past 20 years. Yeah. You're right. If you start looking at the past, there's something. So this is, this is the biggest thing. If you look at my economics, economist colleagues out here, that's exactly what they're working on right now, where they went wrong in terms of their models. And my belief is that the better models that are going to come are going to come from incorporating behavioral economics and neuroeconomics. So you'll have a team, uh, Dick Taylor, for example, at Chicago. He's the one who's kind of propagating that. And these models will start becoming more sophisticated. But you're right, is that in general, if you look at the last 20 years alone, you start seeing, or you start looking at blocks of 12 years. You start seeing that. So the idea here is that if you're getting close to retirement, if let us say you're 12 years away from retirement, right, that the stock market is doing well, cash everything. Be conservative, because there is going to be a stock market crash that will take place, which will hurt you. You might as well take, put the money in your bed under your mattress. <laughs> I'm a lifelong fan of the Chicago Cubs baseball team. Yeah. And until your presentation today, I assumed it was always because my parents dropped me on my head as a <laughs> child. Uh, my question is, as you uh, so correctly pointed out, your research has a great deal of subtlety to it. And when you see headlines in the paper like, women and other brain damaged people make better decisions, uh, what is your response to the media coverage of your work? Do you contact uh, publications that oversimplify your work, or can you just elaborate on how you deal with the press? In a strange way, and I'll, I'll confess, in a strange way, I've learned to play the media game. Um, if I want to be out there, and I'm not someone who craves for the spotlight, even though there's a spotlight on me right now, I don't crave for the spotlight, but if there is something where I will have, through the media, I'm going to have an impact. In other words, there's going to be a broader dissemination of the research that I've done. Um, I will do exactly what the media does. They want a headline, I'll give them a headline. I will kind of hedge, of course. I'll say that, you know what, this is not the complete story and so on. But I know for a fact all the hedging will not appear in the write-up. <laughs> I know that. So I give the headline. And I'll give the subtleties knowing fully well that the subtleties won't appear. 
and that's fine. Now, not all of you are like that. There are some very respectable, for example, when I start dealing with Scientific American, I had one interview done there, that was a much more nuanced and subtle way of presenting the whole thing because they wanted an in-depth story rather than just a flashy headline story. So I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> one more question? Price, please. Okay, um, so the genesis of this particular stream of research came about from my talking to people in industry who are often referred to as price leaders. These are the people who sell based on price. So think about brands like Dell computers. Traditionally, what do they do? Well, they will start focusing on price, 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 price all the time, squeeze out all the inefficiencies in the supply chain, for example. If it is going to be television advertising, Super Bowl advertising going to cost two and a half million dollars, I would rather take that money out, pass it on to the consumers in the form of lower prices. But there is always this puzzle, it puzzled me for a long time. We all know that low price means low quality. Over a period of time, if you start focusing on lower prices, it'll shape people's perceptions of quality. And we know this from years of research. So I would ask these executives at Dell, aren't you concerned about these perceptions, these negative perceptions that are going to be formed? And their typical answer will be the following. They would say, sure, we have to be concerned about it. But you know what? The, this is, these are merely perceptions. The market force will correct for itself. Why? There's going to be someone who will buy a product. And a product we truly believe is of high quality. They will use the product. And when you think about reality versus perception, reality is going to win. And therefore, these people will use the computer. They'll have a good experience of it. And then word of mouth will kick in. They will spread the word around that, hey, these are good computers. And so market force corrects for itself. Therefore, the assumption that there was, that was being made, including in the academic circles was if you think about utility and break it down into its components, you can think about a predicted utility. You're predicting how much of experience that I'm going to extract from buying the laptop or the computer, at what cost, right? That is a prediction. Then I have the actual experience itself, and then of course I have the memory, the remembrance, which is what is going to feed back into my next decision-making process. So the constant kind of updating. So the assumption that they were making was that this perception does not become a self-fulfilling prophecy and negatively affect the experience itself. So I'll present these series of studies to you to convince you that that's not the case, that there is a relationship. One is the painkiller study. And this uh, received the Ig Nobel Award. You folks uh, know about the. So the Ig Nobel Award, if you don't know about this, is, is give, was, was instituted by a team of, uh, of Nobel laureates who said that science is becoming too dry and serious. It has to be more fun. And so we're going to look at science, good science, but which is fun, and we're going to confer this award. So here, if you were a part of the study, what we would have done is we would have sent you a brochure saying that, hey, there is this new medication, a painkiller, that has been approved by the FDA. OK? We'll also tell you that. For one half of you, so it's a between subject design, one half of you will tell you that the price of it is $2.50 a dose. For the rest of you will say it's $2.50, but it has been discounted to 10 cents. You here with me? Now, it's a between subject, so the people who we tell 10 cents don't know what we have said to the other group and vice versa. Now, you come into the lab, and what we do is, and this is how pain research is done, we'll have a device almost like a wristwatch, we put it on your wrist, and we'll deliver electric shocks of different magnitude. OK, it's so like this, and it'll deliver electric shocks. Now, we don't want to kill you, right? <laughs> but you have different pain thresholds. Individuals have different pain thresholds. In the first phase, we find out what is the maximum pain we want to deliver, and then we can de calibrate. We can say, OK, I'm going to deliver 10 different levels of shocks, and after each delivery at random order, we're going to do this. You will express on a visual analog scale, which is how typically pain research is done, you will express how much of pain you're experiencing. Now. I give you the pill. Of course, unbeknownst to you, it is only a sugar pill. It's only a placebo. You don't know about it. 
You think you're consuming this new medication. Some of you think it is 10 cents. Some of you think it is $2.50. And after about 10 minutes, because we want that the perception that they have taken, the medication has taken its effects, I move on and once again re-deliver the shots, the same levels, but at random order. So I have before and after now. And what I'm trying to examine is that, how much of improvement, relief from pain, did the, did the individual receive on average across all the different levels of shocks? And what we find here is that if you think about the people who got it at $2.50, 85% of them received pain relief compared to only 61. But what is amazing, remember, all you're getting is a sugar pill. Think about the power of the brain here, right? 60%, at least 60% of the people receive pain relief. Now, of course, you'll make the argument that this is still only a perception. We didn't actually study the human brain and so on to see how much of pain people experience. So let us get into some more fun studies. Second is the energy drink study. So here what we did was, you're a participant in the study. You'll come into the lab, and we'll tell you that the study is about energy drink. We, wanted to, we want to find out whether these energy drinks like Red Bull, et cetera, which are consumed by a lot of college students, by the way, a lot of people now, younger people, consume this because high-end caffeine, amino acids, and so on, and it's, it's believed to kind of improve mental equity. That's why we also consume coffee, many of us, and so on. So the idea here is that you, you're going to be consuming this. We don't know whether it's efficacious or not. You'll consume this drink, and then you'll solve a series of word jumble puzzles. OK? Now, so we give you the, uh, we, we, you come in, you buy the drink from us. Now, in other studies, we don't have to buy. We just give it to you. But in this study, what I'm going to talk about is that you buy the drink. One half of you will pay me $1.89, which is the regular price. And we'll tell you it's the regular price. You folks will know the regular price, but you'll have to pay me only 89 cents. Not $1.89 that they paid. But we'll tell you what the reason for that. We'll tell you that this is because we got an institutional discount, and we're passing that on to you. And to take care of obvious quality control issues, we're going to tell everyone that this, what we're going to give you is from the most recent batch manufactured. So there are no obvious quality issues and so on. It's about the freshest batch, right? Now. Now what we do is, you consume this drink, we wait for about 10 minutes out here, and then you start solving these puzzles. Like tuple, now keep in mind, these are tough uh, puzzles in a sense that the first response will be tulip, and then you have to unstuck yourself. Burkham, you'll say camber, and then you have to say, no, 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 it's not camber, it doesn't make sense, you have to do embark, right? Now I can get two dependent variables from here, the first dependent variable is how many puzzles do you solve and you solve. Second dependent variable is how much are you persisting in this task, you and you. And I, I can do that because I know the time you're spending on each puzzle. I also know if you're giving up. So you had 30 minutes to solve 15 puzzles. Are you giving up before the 30 minutes is over? I have that measure as well. So one gets at the number of puzzles, second gets at persistence, motivation, and so on. And what we found here is systematically across a series of studies that you folks who got it at a discount will end up solving fewer puzzles than you folks who bought this at a regular price. And we will also see systematically that you folks will be less motivated, less persistent. If you're faced with the hurdle, you don't want to persist and move on. Okay, we'll see why this happens in a second if time permits. Okay. So this, is, this now starts saying that, wait a second, price is actually affecting the actual experience utility. In this particular case, your ability to solve puzzles, or in a broader sense, your mental acuity. You're consuming this drink for that, and it is, not, it is failing you in a sense. So here's a more fun study, which Jim referred to, which is the wine fMRI study. Wine is a strange beast, right, if you think about it. Because you have so many varieties of wine, so many different regions, so many different prices at which these are a huge range of prices out there. And if you think about it, people, even connoisseurs, will say that higher the price of the wine, the more pleasure I'm going to derive from the wine. That's what they would say. The question we asked here is that, wait a second. We do know an area of the brain, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex that I talked about before with Phineas Gage lost, that is the area of the brain that codes for pleasure, the experience pleasure. Of course, there are things coming from the taste buds. 
but then the ultimate pleasure is being coded out there in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So we can ask a question. Suppose I put you in an fMRI machine, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, where I can monitor your full brain activity in real time. You're lying down in the fMRI machine. I'm going to tell you that you're going to be served with five different Cabernet Sauvignons. Prices, market prices ranging from $5 to $90. Okay? You're lying down in the fMRI machine. There are constraints in the fMRI, by the way, you can't move and so on. So we have to take care of that. Anyway, there's a straw inserted. There are two straws actually inserted in your mouth. And you receive the price, so it might be $90 out there, and wine is squirted into your mouth. <laughs> now, you kind, of, you kind of keep it and in the mouth for about five seconds. No, you keep it for exactly for five seconds, and then you swallow it. And we know when you swallow. If you swallow earlier, we know because we have a device here that knows when you swallow. Okay. Now, through the other straw, water is delivered, so you rinse your mouth. Then there might be $10 out there, and the next wine is squirted in your mouth. The same thing goes on, and we are constantly monitoring your brain activity when that is happening. Question we ask is, is it possible that the area of the brain that codes for pleasure will be more active when the wine is higher priced than when it is lower priced? One thing I can tell you is that unbeknownst to you, it is the same wine that is being delivered. And you don't know about that. OK. And that's exactly what we found, that the brain itself is deriving more pleasure if the wine is higher priced than when it is lower priced. Now, keep this in mind. It's not going to happen with an expert like Robert Parker and so on. I mean, these are people who have 8,000 wine tastings. They can even tell subtle differences and so on. It's not going to happen there. Most of us are not like Robert Parker. Even though we think we're experts in wines, we're not. And it is also not going to happen if the wine that is going to be delivered, I'm going to tell you it's a $90 wine, but what is delivered to me is a two, two buck chuck. That is Trader Joe's two buck chuck. It's not going to work because $2 wines are not going to be aged in oak barrels and so on, so don't have the oaky notes and so on. So you can tell, right? So it's not going to happen. But for most of the time, the wine that is out there falls within what we call the latitude of acceptance. It's just falling out there, somewhere in the middle. Right? If you look at the bell curve, it's somewhere falling out there. When that happens, your brain will actually increase the pleasure it's going to derive from the drink if it is higher priced than lower priced. So what this is telling us is that that assumption, the conventional wisdom that existed out there until we came out of this research, is not right. That in fact, your predicted utility, what you expect, is going to translate into a self-fulfilling prophecy and influence your actual experience itself. In other words, what you, what you pay what you get for. Now, I know there are some women, I have some time out here, you know, I know some people are saying, wait a second, you know what? Women love shopping, and especially love shopping for items on sale. That's what gives them the excitement. Right, we have this evidence across, I mean, different cultures we have. You look at, you look at uh, women and you see, irrespective of income levels, you see that their main kind of excitement comes from here, the predicted utility, the excitement that comes from going to a shopping, discovering something, surprise, and so on. Men, irrespective of income status, don't have that buzz from this, this kind of excitement. If you give them something on sale, they'll take it. But they don't give the same kind of excitement. Now, the women who buy on sale, we also have these studies that have shown this, women who actually buy an item on sale are also more likely to give up, dispose of the item, more likely to use the product less, fewer times, and so on. But that is fine. If you think about the marketers, that's fine. Why? You dispose it off, you're going to come back into the market. <laughs> so I keep selling you. So the way you think about this is that, from a broad standpoint, it is going to be, if, if you look at the notation out here, it's going to be a sigma of all these different predicted utility. For women, in terms of apparel, I would rather put my attention on predicted utility, doing something in the shopping thing, all these surprises, bam, 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 out there. Maybe, low, maybe lower prices in the form of lower prices, but that is fine, because, yeah, the woman is not going to use that more, but that's fine, they're going to come back into the market. But for men, they don't, that's not the area that is kind of thing. They don't, they don't like this, I mean, they don't care about these. You give them, they'll take it. 
So for them, you're going to put more attention on the experience. You charge higher prices, make sure that they're getting this experience utility. That is where they're deriving the entire utility from, and that is what is going to drive the next decision. Make sense? So just to kind of sum up, let me kind of, and we might have opportunity for a couple of questions. Um, so if you go back to all these sayings out there, here is a quote from Jane Austen. What she says here is that, why not seize the pleasure at once, right? How often is happiness destroyed by preparation, foolish preparation, all this anticipation built up, just do it, right? Well, I mean, that clearly is not right. So you have another kind of statement here which says that, <laughs> this is coming from another Indian who says that most men and I'm, I'm sure that is right, I think he referred to men. Most men pursue pleasure with such breathless haste that they simply hurry past it, right? So I'll end up with my own quote, and that is, it is in the anticipation of pleasure that pleasure itself resides. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.